But now, on Radio 4... The Chronicles of Clovis, adapted by Justin Green from the short stories of Saki, with Mark Tandy as Clovis. Episode 1, Clovis's First Night. Circle entrance is outside on the right, sir. Uh, may I see your ticket, sir? Certainly. Oh, the roll box, sir. Yes. Uh, would you like to follow the signs to the dress circle, sir? With box. Uh, can I see your on opening night, how did you manage yes, to swing uh, that, Clovis? A gift from the Baroness. I thought you weren't on speaking terms. No, we weren't for a couple of years, but we've made our peace. And she just gave you the tickets, just like that? No, not just like that. I had to explain my need was greater than Miriam Klopstock's. Miriam's only interest is point to point. She'd probably use the royal box as a treat for her horse. And what was your need? Well, if anyone asks, you're my elderly aunt from India with a passion for the theatre and only a week to live. Oh, God, Clovis. Relax, Reggie, no one will ask. Here we are. The royals don't get all that good of you, really, do they? Not at the stage, but they get an excellent view of the audience. As every first-nighter should know, that is invariably more interesting. I've heard you're writing something, Clovis. Not a play, is it? No, no. My memoirs, actually. At 21? Isn't that a little premature? Autobiography is more lucrative than fiction. Well, you've had an offer to publish it? Well, not yet. But several offers of hush money. <clears throat> the Howl of Asthma Home. What do you know about it? Oh, it should be fairly amusing. It's a tragedy in the manner of Ibsen. In the first three acts, the heroine is supposed to be dying of consumption. In the last, they find out she's really dying of cancer. Oh, no given the whole thing away. Nonsense, you're suitably prepared. If you nod off, hard to avoid in the theatre, you won't lose the thread. You ever tried your hand at drama, Clovis? At drama, constantly, but at a play, only once. Written for the Baroness, as a matter of fact. And was she pleased? Hardly. It was the reason we didn't speak for a year or two. Ironic, really, as the enterprise originated as a peace offering. Yep. There's been an election down here, and the Liberal member unseated. No end of bitterness and ill feeling, and the county is socially divided against itself. I thought a, a play of some kind would be an excellent opportunity of bringing people together and giving them something to think of beside tiresome political squabbles. Could you pass the jam? We might do something along the lines of a Greek tragedy. Thank you. The Return of Agamemnon, for instance. Well, that title sounds rather reminiscent of an election result. Oh, it wasn't that sort of a return. It was a homecoming. I thought you said it was a tragedy. Well, it was. He was killed in his bathroom, you know. Oh, I know the story, of course. Do you want me to take the part of Charlotte Corday? Yeah, that was a different story and a different century. Oh. The dramatic unities forbid one to lay a scene in more than one century at a time. The killing in this case has to be done by Clytemnestra. Rather well, a pretty name. I'll do that part. I suppose you want to be Aga, whatever his name is. Oh, dear, no. Aga Memnon was a father of grown-up children and probably wore a beard and looked prematurely aged. I shall be his charioteer or, or bath attendant or something decorative of that kind. We must do everything in the sumu-run manner, you know. I don't know. At least I, I should know better if you explain exactly what you mean by the sumu-run method. Weird music and... Exotic skippings and flying leaps and lots of drapery and undrapery, particularly undrapery. I think I told you the county are coming. The county won't stand anything very Greek. You can get over that objection by calling it hygiene or limb culture or something of that sort. My dear boy, I can ask the county to a Greek play or to a costume play, but to a Greek costume play, never. Mm. I have to live here, remember, at least for a time. I got this place on a seven years lease. As to skippings and flying leaps, I must ask Emily Dushford to take part. She's a dear good thing and will do anything she's told or try to. It is hard to imagine her doing flying leap. Oh, she can be Cassandra. And she need only take flying leaps into the future, in, in a metaphorical sense. Cassandra? Rather oh, pretty name. What kind of character is she? She was a sort of advance agent for calamities. To know her was to know the worst. Fortunately for the gaiety of the age she lived in, no one took her very seriously. Still... It must have been fairly galling to have her turning up after every catastrophe with a conscious air of, perhaps another time you'll believe what I say. I should have wanted to kill her. As Clytemnestra, I believe you gratify that very wish. Then it is a happy ending, in spite of it being a tragedy. Well, hardly. You see, 
The satisfaction of putting a violent end to Cassandra must have been considerably dampened by the fact that she had foretold what was going to happen to her. She probably died with an intensely irritating, what did I tell you, smile on her lips. And what sort of end do I have? I mean, what sort of curtain do I get? I suppose you rush into your lover's arms. That is where one of the flying leaps will come in. Oh, divine! So what went wrong? Emily Dushford didn't help the tensions. I had asked her to improvise her prophecies based on historical research. After several hours' conscientious study, all she came up with was... Woe, Trojans! Woe to Troy! I, Cassandra, see the fall Emily, of Emily, Emily, it's no use foretelling the fall of Troy because Troy has fallen before the action of the play begins. Oh, oh, right. Um, whoa, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa to Cassandra! Uh, and you mustn't refer to your own impending doom either because that'll give things away too soon to the audience. Oh, oh, right, right. Mm. Um... I know. I'll predict a long and happy reign for George V. My dear girl, have you reflected that Cassandra specialised in foretelling calamities? Oh, yes. Uh, I know. I'll foretell a really disastrous season for the fox house. Oh, no account. Do remember what Clovis said, Emily. All Cassandra's predictions came true. The master of foxhounds and the hunt secretary are both awfully superstitious and both going to be present. Oh, right. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Her flight from the room was the nearest she got to the sumu run method. But the chief problem was the most common of all in the theatre, a clash of ego. Ready, everyone? Oh. A uh, clovis? What exactly is that you're wearing? It's my tunic for the attendant. Very nice. This isn't a dress rehearsal, you know. No, but I sort of wanted to wear it in. Just feel that. It's real panther skin. Go on, everyone. Oh, yes. Thank Lord Haddon loaned it to me. Yes, lovely. But do you feel it's quite right for a bath attendant? I think it's perfect. It looks quite impractical for cleaning the bath in even a royal one. I don't clean the bath. I bathe the king. Yes, well, I do not speak selfishly, I assure you, but I feel it would benefit the entire production if the panther skin went to Clytemnestra. Clytemnestra would not wear a panther skin tunic. Well, she might wear a rather fine panther skin cloak, don't you think, everyone? Oh, oh yes, she must. We'll discuss this oh, yes. later, shall we? By all means, by all means. Let's go from my entrance. Are you ready, Greek damsels? Yes. You maids of Argus. Say, where is the king? Oh, lovely stripling, radiant as the dawn. Clovis, dear. What is it now? I just wanted to say that that is an exquisite line, radiant as the dawn. Thank you. Again. No, oh, no, I'm, lovely stripling. I'm not, I'm not sure the damsels should be quite so fulsome in their praise of a glorified masseur. Perhaps the line should be transposed to my entrance and amended to... Oh, Clytemnestra, radiant as the dawn. I bet you went absolutely wild. For once, I scorned the sumu run and calmly resolved to be gentle and assiduous in my private coaching of Cassandra. The Baroness and I appeared to sink our mutual differences. Come. Oh, here you are, clearly it's your first night card. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> And I have one for you. Oh, how lovely. What is it? Trojan horse. Is it? It's all so exciting. It's a full house, you know, the county of mustard in strength. Well, let's hope our play has the desired effect. You look quite stunning. Oh, <laughs> and you've done a splendid job. Well, break a leg, darling. Mm. Mm. The return of Agamemnon began extremely well. Though only the Baroness and I and... Possibly Lucretia Harrowcluff's band could truly be said to have attempted the sumu run. But still, to a distance that my heart belongs. Yeah. It's you now, Emily. Just take a deep breath and you'll be fine. Yes, Irene. I must make a quick dash to the dressing room. <laughs> Off you go, Emily. Right. I, Cassandra, see woe for this fair county if the brood of corrupt, self-seeking, unscrupulous, unprincipled politicians of the Conservative Party continue to infest and poison our local councils. And I will find. Oh, God, that's 
The Baroness returned, expecting to be greeted with old Clytemonestra radiant as the dawn, but heard only the imperious tones of Lady Thistledale. offering it worked a treat. Both political parties found common ground in condemning the Baroness's outrageous behaviour. But how could she ever forgive you? Because she was fortunate in subletting the greater part of her seven-year lease. Hey, isn't that Miriam Klopstock down there? Oh, Lord. Uh, have you dropped something? I don't want her to see me. Hello, Miss Sangrell. Too late. And I think she's coming up. I rather suspect that Miriam Klopstock has heard something about my book of personal reminiscences, namely that it is to leave nothing out. I see. Yes. It's a sobering thought, isn't it, Reginald? It, not that Miriam needs sobering. She's the leading light of the National Temperance Society. The book does seem to have caused rather a stir. All sorts of people keep coming up to me and begging me not to put things in that I've completely forgotten had ever happened. The Chronicles of Clovis, I shall call it. Clovis? Oh, this is your elderly aunt, I presume. Hello, Miriam. You know very well that that is Reginald Chilworth, Miriam. My aunt, if you must know, had a more pressing engagement in a different sort of box. Her funeral was on Thursday. How awful. Do forgive me, Clovis. But, but last Thursday you were at the Monkton's bridge party. I saw you. But I declared only on black suits. I was very fond of my aunt. Well, I'm sorry to trouble you at such a time, but I've heard you're writing some sort of book. Quite right. And it'll record things that have happened to people in your circle? Your sources are impeccable. Oh, your mother, actually. She's quite worried about it, too. Well, I just wanted to remind you that you promised never to tell anyone about me in that unfortunate episode at Mrs. Nicorax. I'm sorry? In the bathroom. Doesn't ring a bell. With my chow. Oh, that! Do you know, it entirely slipped my mind. Oh, thank goodness for that. No, my promise, I mean. The incident is clearly described. I've just been telling Reginald. It has a very prominent place in the very first chapter, haven't I, Reginald? Um... Clovis, well, well, you must strike it out at once. I shall certainly strike out the mention of the spits. I could have sworn it was a spits, not a child, but I'm grateful for the correction. You shall certainly receive an appreciative footnote. Footnote? I shall be ruined. You mustn't. You can't. You promise, Clovis Sangrell. I've always thought you the sort who'd keep a promise. I wouldn't dream of it. I'd as soon think of keeping white mice. Shh. Starting you do. Did you hear the wolves again last night, Hedlund? Well, you're not the boy I took you for. <laughs> you sound like an eagle arriving at Olympus with the wrong Ganymede. No, Horvath. <laughs> How could you? Poor Hannah. Poor Did Hannah. Hannah. the bathroom with the chow. Though it's far too tedious to recall. The doctor will try to call again today. No, Miriam's in the clear. It's the likes of Septimus Brope which should fear exposure. Septimus Brope? It doesn't we sound very scandalous. Appearances can be deceptive, as I found out. The child is Better tell me afterwards, Clovis. The whole point of having a box is so you can talk through the play. Anyway, I'm far more interesting than anything Scandinavian. Be quiet there! Keep your voice down. It'll only annoy our neighbours if they can't eavesdrop successfully. I accompanied my aunt to the River Sedges Garden Party. The roses look magnificent, don't they, aunt? Oh. What variety is that, Mrs. Riversedge? Oh, I'm very proud of her. She's a Viscountess Folkestone. I believe you have a Septimus Brope here. Extremely unlikely. It's a variety not to be found in the better class of garden. Oh, Mr. Septimus Brope is one of my guests. Ah. Do you mind if I smoke? Well... It discourages the green fly. And who and what is Mr. Brope? I believe, Mrs. Troyle, he comes from Leighton Buzzard. In these days of rapid and convenient travel, to come from Leighton Buzzard does not necessarily denote any great strength of character. It might only mean mere restlessness. What does he do? He edits the Cathedral Monthly, and he's enormously learned about memorial brasses and transepts and all those sorts of things. Perhaps he is just a little bit heavy and immersed in one range of subjects, but it takes all sorts to make a good house party, you know. You don't find him too dull, do you? Oh, dullness I could overlook. What I cannot forgive is his making love to my maid. My dear Mrs. Troyer, what an extraordinary idea. 
Oh, I assure you, Mr. Brope would not dream of doing such a thing. His dreams are a matter of indifference to me. For all I care, his slumbers may be one long indiscretion of unsuitable erotic advances in oh. which the entire servants' hall may be involved. But in his waking hours, he shall not make love to my maid. It is oh, no but... use arguing about it. I'm firm on the point. Oh, but you must be mistaken. Mr. Brope would be the last person to do such a he thing. He is the first person to do such a thing, as far as my information goes, and if I have any voice in the matter, he certainly shall be the last. Of course, I'm not referring to respectably intentioned lovers. Oh, I simply cannot think that a man who writes so charmingly and informingly about transepts and Byzantine influences would behave in such an unprincipled manner. What evidence have you that he's doing anything of the sort? Oh, I, I don't want to doubt your word, of course, but we mustn't be too ready to condemn him unheard, must we? Whether we condemn him or not, he has certainly not been unheard. He has the room next to my dressing room, and on two occasions when I dare say he thought I was absent, I have plainly heard him announcing through the wall, I love you, Florrie. Oh. Your partition walls upstairs are very thin. One can almost hear a watch ticking in the next room. Is your maid called Florence? Her name is Florinda. <laughs> what an extraordinary name to give a maid. I did not give it to her. She arrived in my service already christened. Oh, what I mean is that when I get maids with unsuitable names, I call them Jane. They soon get used to it. An excellent plan. Unfortunately, I have got used to being called Jane myself. It happens to be my name. Oh, Mrs. Troyal, do forgive me. Of course, Jane is a perfectly charming The question maid. is not whether I'm to call my maid Florinda, but whether Mr. Brope is to be permitted to call her Florrie. I am strongly of the opinion that he shall not. He, he may have been repeating the words of some song. There are lots of those sorts of silly refrains with girls' names. You mustn't call me Mary. I shouldn't dream of doing so. In the first place, I've always understood that your name was Henrietta. And in the second, I hardly know you well enough to take such a liberty. Oh, no, I mean there's a song with that refrain. And there's Rhoda, Rhoda, kept a pagoda. And um, Maisie is a daisy. And heaps of others. Certainly, it doesn't sound like Mr. Brope to be singing such songs. But I think we ought to give him the benefit of the doubt. I had already done so until further evidence came my way. Further evidence? Oh, do tell me. But as I was coming upstairs after breakfast, mm. Mr. Brope was just passing my room. In the most natural way in the world, a piece of paper dropped out of a packet that he held in his hand and fluttered to the ground just at my door. I was going to call out to him, you've dropped something, and then, for some reason, mm. I held back and didn't show myself till he was safely in his room. You see, it occurred to me that I was very seldom in my room just at that hour and that Florinda was almost always tidying up things about that time. So I picked up the innocent-looking piece of paper. I'm afraid you just decapitated the Countess Folkestone in full bloom. What was on the paper? Just the words in pencil, I love you, Flory. <gasps> and then underneath, crossed out with a faint line, but perfectly plain to read, meet me in the garden by the yew. There is a yew tree at the bottom of the garden. At any rate, he appears to be truthful. Oh, to think that a scandal of this sort should be going on under my roof. I wonder why it is that scandal seems so much worse under a roof. I've always regarded it as proof of the superior delicacy of the cat tribe that it conducts most of its scandals above the slates. Now that I come to think of it, there are things about Mr. Broke that I've never been able to account for. His income, for instance. He only gets 200 a year as editor of the Cathedral Monthly, and I know that his people are quite poor, and he hasn't any private means. Yet he manages to afford a flat somewhere in Westminster, and he goes abroad to Bruges and those sorts of places every year, and always dresses is well and, and gives quite nice luncheon parties in the season. You can't do all that on 200 a year, can you? Does he write for any other papers? No. You see, he specializes so entirely on liturgy and ecclesiastical architecture that his field is rather restricted. Perhaps he sells spurious transepts to American enthusiasts. Oh, how can you sell transepts? 
Such a thing would be impossible. Well, whatever he may do to eke out his income, he is certainly not going to fill in his leisure moments by making love to my maid. Oh, of course not. That must be put a stop to at once. But I don't quite know what we ought to do. You might put a barbed wire entanglement round the yew tree as a precautionary measure. I don't think that the disagreeable situation that has arisen is improved by flippancy. A good maid is a treasure... I'm sure I don't know what I should do without Florinda. She understands my hair. Oh. I've long ago given up trying to do anything with it myself. I regard one's hair as I regard husband's. As long as one is seen together in public, one's private divergences don't matter. Ah, oh, was that the luncheon gong? After the meal, quite decent as I remember, we began with asparagus, with hollandaise. I followed Brope into the smoking room. First act over already? Oh, I'm parched. A glass of bubbly would go down very nicely. What do you think of the howl of asthma home, Reginald? Well, I can't say I've really heard very much of it. You don't need to. You can smell it. It's a stinker. Isn't that a little hasty? No, I mean the chief innovation of this production is the smell. The producer is very proud of it. Didn't you detect that wolfy fragrance drifting over the footlights? Perhaps I should try my hand at a modern drama. What about? Well, no one will understand the drift of it, but everyone will go back to their homes with a vague feeling of dissatisfaction with their lives and surroundings. Then they'll put up new wallpapers and forget. And what about those that have oak panelling all over the house? Well, they can always put up new stair carpets. Please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. The performance is about to continue. Now, where were we? The ah, yes. In search of Mr. Broke. Yes. Well, I found him conveniently alone in the smoking room and a state of some agitation. I'll be sorry, so sorry. Oh, dear, it won't do. It just won't do. What is a lorry? I don't mean the thing on wheels, Mr. Sangrail. Of course, I know what that is. But isn't there a bird with a name like that, the larger form of a lorikeet? I fancy it's a lorry with one R. In which case, it's no good to you. Well, I... How do you mean, no good to me? Won't rhyme with Flory. How did you find out? I mean, how did you know I was trying to get a rhyme to Flory? I didn't know. I only guessed. When you wanted to turn the prosaic lorry of commerce into a feathered poem flitting through the verdure of a tropical oh, forest, uh... I knew you must be working up a sonnet. <coughs> and Flory was the only female name that suggested itself as rhyming with lorry. I believe you know more. Aha. Uh -huh. How much do you know? The yew tree in the garden? There! I felt certain I dropped it somewhere. But you must have guessed something before. You won't give me away, will you? No, oh, it is nothing to be ashamed of, but it wouldn't do for the editor of the Cathedral Monthly to go in openly for that sort of thing, would it? No, oh, I suppose not. You see, I get quite a decent lot of money out of it. I could never live in the style I do on what I get as editor of the Cathedral Monthly. Do you mean to say you get money out of Flory? Not out of Flory, as yet. In fact, I don't mind saying that I'm having a good deal of trouble over Flory. But there are a lot of others. This is very interesting. There are heaps of others. Uh, for instance, Cora with the lips of coral, you and I will never quarrel. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of my earliest uh, successes, mm. and it still brings me in royalties. And there is Esmeralda, when I first beheld her, and <laughs> fair Teresa, mm. how I love to please her. <laughs> Both of those have been fairly popular. And there is one rather dreadful one, which has brought me in more money than any of the others. Lively little Lucy with the naughty neighbor to say. <laughs> well, of course, I loathe a whole lot of them. In fact, I'm rapidly becoming something of a woman hater under their influence, but I can't afford to disregard the financial aspect of the matter. What is the special trouble with Flory? I can't get her into lyric shape, try as I will. You see, one has to work in a lot of sentimental, sugary compliments with a catchy rhyme and a certain amount of personal biography or prophecy. Um, for instance, there is... Dainty little girly Mavis, she is such a rarer Avis. All the money I can save is all to be for Mavis mine. I can't bring myself to sing it. It goes to a sickening, namby-pamby waltz tune, and for months nothing else was sung and hummed in 
Blackpool and have a popular centers. <laughs> Please excuse me, but I can't help it when I remember the awful solemnity of that article of yours that you so kindly read us last night on, on the Coptic Church and its relation to Christian worship. Oh, you see how it would be. As soon as people knew me to be the author of that miserable, sentimental twaddle, all respect for the serious labors of my life would be gone. Can you wonder that I positively hate Florrie all the time that I'm trying to grind out sugar-coated rhapsodies about her? Why not give free play to your emotions and be brutally abusive? I believe an uncomplimentary refrain would have an instant success as a novelty if you were sufficiently outspoken. Oh, I'm afraid I couldn't break away from the habit of fulsome adulation and suddenly change my style. Oh, you needn't change your style in the least. Merely reverse the sentiment and keep to the inane phraseology of the thing. If you do the body of the song, I'll knock off the refrain, which is the thing that principally matters, I believe. I shall charge half shares in the royalties and throw in my silence as your guilty secret. Oh, Mr. Songrail. Of course, if in sheer gratitude at my silence you'd like to take me for a much-needed holiday to the Adriatic or somewhere equally interesting, paying all the expenses, I shouldn't dream of refusing. Mm. Here's my hand on it, mm. Mr. Songrail. Later that afternoon, I sought out my aunt and Mrs. Riversedge to break the news. You told them the truth. Shh. You know me better than that. I've spoken to Mr. Brope about F. How splendid of you. What did he say? He said he wanted to be understood, and for some reason thought that Florinda would excel in that requirement. Good heavens. But I pointed out that there were probably dozens of delicately nurtured, pure-hearted young English girls who would be quite capable of understanding him, while Florinda was the only person in the world who understood my aunt's hair. Quite so. That rather weighed with him, for he's not really a selfish animal if you take him in the right way. And when I appealed to the memory of his happy, childish days, spent amid the daisied fields of Leighton Buzzard, I suppose daisies do grow there, he was obviously affected. But did he agree to put Florinda out of his mind? Absolutely. Oh. He gave me his word. Oh, I'm saved. And he has agreed to go for a short trip abroad as the best distraction for his thoughts. I have offered to go with him as far as Ragusa. Oh, how can we ever thank you? Well, if my aunt should wish to give me a really nice type in to be chosen by myself, as a small recognition of the very considerable service I have done her, I shouldn't dream of refusing. I'm not one of those people who think that because one is abroad, one can go about dressed anyhow. The pin is the one I'm wearing. You see? Very elegant. And you wrote Mr. Brophy's refrain? Yes. I had the advantage for my inspiration of knowing my aunt's maid. Did you ever hear it? Uh, How you bore me, Florrie, with quiet. those eyes of vacant Shh. blue. Uh, You'll God. be very sorry, Florrie, if I marry you. I Though say. I'm easy going, Florrie, this I swear is true. I can see the moon, Mother. I can see the moon. No, Alfred, no. That's the trouble with a tragedy. You can't hear yourself sing. Yes, I'll throw you down a quarry, Florrie, if... I marry you. I think they like me. The Chronicles of Clovis was adapted by Justin Green from the short stories of Saki. Clovis was played by Mark Tandy, Mrs. Riversedge and the sobbing actress by Rebecca Front, Miriam Klopstock and Emily Dushford by Sylvester Latuzel, the Anguished Actor by David McAllister, The Greek Damsel by Abigail McKern, The Baroness by Prunella Scales, Septimus Broke by John Sessions, The Aunt by Angela Thorne, and Reginald by Samuel West. The music was composed and performed by John White. The Chronicles of Clovis was an independent production by Hattrick Productions for Radio 4. The series producer was Lissa Evans, and the producer was Justin Green. And next week you can join Clovis Sangrail on a rather unusual tour of the Royal Academy in the second episode of The Chronicles of Clovis. <laughs>